welcome. I'm excited to have an evening with Dr. Jim Delisle, uh, a resident expert in our state living in Myrtle Beach. Um, Jim, De Jim Delisle has taught gifted kids and those who work for him on their behalf in the last 35 years. He retired from Kent State University in 2008 after 25 years of service there as a professor of special education. Throughout his career, Jim has taken time away from college teaching to return to his classroom rooms, volunteering as a second fourth, and a sixth grade teacher in 1991, 97, and 2006. Two, Jim taught gifted middle school students one day a week between 1998 and 2006 in Plainsburg, Ohio Public Schools. Currently, Jim works part time to finally get to ninth and tenth graders in the Scholars Academy in Conway, South Carolina. He's the author of more than 250 articles and 19 books. Jim's work has been translated into multiple languages and has been featured in both professional journals and in popular media, media such as the New York Times, People Magazine, and on Oprah. Jim's newest book, Dumbing Down America, the War on the Nation's Brightest Young Minds, and What We Can Do to Fight Back, it's in published now. Yeah, in August. So it's out and stands now. A frequent presenter throughout the United States, Jim has also addressed audiences in nations as diverse as England, Greece, China, Oman, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. He comes with a wealth of experience in children. And it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to him. Good evening, folks. How are you? <laughs> I thank you for coming out. Uh, uh, thank you for being here. Th Denise, thank you for the invite. I was here in August working with teachers. I really enjoyed it, so it's great to be back. It's, I don't like to be this formal. You were the crowd this size, but we're taping this, so we need to, I need to stand in the mic and thank Jamal for making this all happen. So I hope you don't mind the formality, but it's, it's so other folks who couldn't be here today can have a chance to see this at some future point. Well, I've done this for working with gifted kids for about 39 years and started in special ed. I was a teacher of kids with disabilities for a number of years. And because of a kid in my class who was labeled as behavior disordered, emotionally disturbed, but also happened to be incredibly bright, I knew how to deal with the bad behaviors, but I wasn't sure how to deal with the giftedness that he obviously had. And so that's when I went back after three years of teaching to get my doctorate working about working with gifted and never thought I'd be in it as long as I have. It's just been an amazing career. And the best part now is even though I'm retired, and my wife's also an educator, so she's retired and we both kind of found new niches. And my niche is just a couple days a month teaching here in South Carolina and up at the Scholars Academy, which is one of the most remarkable schools I've ever worked at. It's, it's very rare in the country to have a public school that is like this basically kids who come to our high school, which is on a college campus, it's on the Coastal Carolina University campus. 170 kids, that's all. And they come from middle school to high school, but they start taking college courses immediately. And they actually end up, for the most part, finishing their associate's degree in college prior to getting their high school diploma. So uh, my next day working with these kids will be on Friday, it's just a remarkable bunch of kids, sometimes high pressure, as you can imagine, when all of a sudden everyone's the smart kid, and they used to be the only smart kid, and then so the, it comes up with some interesting dynamics, but it's just a joy to be with, with these students, even though it's only a couple of days a month. It's like being a grandparent, you know, I go home at the end, they don't have homework, all these great things, so it's like being an educational grandparent, if you will. Also, my wife and I raised a son who was identified as gifted, he was in the second or third grade, and He's now on his own financially. So if something happened, something worked right, and he's actually a, a special effects editor in San Francisco and just won an Emmy last year for his work on an internet-based TV show. So we're kind of cool, proud parents of, of, of really intelligent, creative young man. Well, not young as well. But anyway, uh, thanks for coming tonight. What I'd like to do is talk for about an hour and then open it up for questions, dialogue, anything that you'd like to, like to review. This is a book I wrote about parenting gifted kids. It came out a few years ago. And it, I never intended to write this book, but 
but I, because this talk was really basically to give, and finally a publisher says, have you written this up anywhere? And I said, no, he said, you should. And so that's what I did. And some of the things that I'll talk about tonight, we won't have time for all of these, but these are basically the chapters in the book. And I'd like to review a few of these things with you, because time and again, as both a parent as well as a counselor and a teacher, I hear parents who are concerned about a number of issues related to their, to their given kids. And so we'll go over a few of these numbers. One, two, three especially, um, and also number five, on less than perfection would be more than acceptable. We're certainly free to go other places, but that's just where the starting point will be and see how much time we have. But let me share with you a or two and see if this sounds like anyone you know. Kids are coming home from school. It was sad. I never saw anyone break down and cry in math class before. Well, he's from another school, and I suppose he was frustrated. He should realize that math is something you can't learn overnight. I know. Maybe he ought to consider teaching about the subject. Uh, I put this up because I find that a lot of times both parents and teachers aren't quite sure what this gifted thing is all about. Uh, does it mean straight A's? Could you be a gifted kid and not get good grades? Is it something you do, like get good grades, or is it someone you are, like the way you think and the intense feelings and emotions that you have? What is this thing all about? There's so many definitions you give to this out there. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly, exactly what it is. But let me give you some indicators. First from a mom who wrote about who her gifted kid was. It goes like this. Their minds are black holes, endless pits that you just keep pouring information into as they beg for more. Life for them is an existential dichotomy, simultaneously too much and never enough. Time is not a concept they acknowledge, just an unnecessary intrusion into their world of fascination. It's true that they have infinite potential, but being eminently aware of the infinity concept, they are often completely overwhelmed with the multitude of choices and interests that lay before them. They challenge everyone around them, parent, teacher, or friend, to be the very best they can be. And if you're really lucky and it doesn't kill you, you get to be all three. I want you to think about the child who brought you here tonight. If you have more than one, you just take on. When did you first suspect that they were a gifted kid? And what gave you the indicator? And what I'll do is I'll repeat it so folks listening to this later can hear it. But does anyone have, when did you first notice it? And So the first indicator was actually older when he was 14 years old. We wrote the ending for Romeo and Juliet, complete with illustrations, complete with My Little Pony characters, and it was all interpreted the correct way. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Who else? Anyone before the age of five? Okay. Can you indicate what, what it was? Yeah.
So he's five years old. You are using large vocabulary with him. He's understanding it. Not only taking it in, but then he's starting to use those vocabulary words in his daycare. That's, that's a good indicator at age five. Who else with a young, really young example? You have one where um, you didn't really know. It came more as a surprise to you. Yes? a lot of things there, but uh, again, those folks who are listening to this on tape, uh, two years old, he started speaking full sentences. Three years old, started reading the dictionary. Uh, and this intense empathy, and intense, well, intense empathy, uh, the example you gave of seeing his poster about the lost children, and just crying because even at a very young age, he understood that was just a wrong thing, and a bad thing, and a sad thing. When we get later into the talk, the word that I use to describe most of the I know is intense and doesn't necessarily describe your child, but I see a lot of nodding heads out there, and we'll get into what those intensities are and how you can work with them in a way that's more positive than uh, kind of limit putting, if you will. We'll get into that in a bit. But yeah, a lot of these kids have, they have a, what someone described as an old soul in a young body. They have a lot of insights that people their age, whether it's four or eight or 15, don't really have, and they're not sure where to put that. And he also brought up the idea of a peer group. Where does he fit? Because he knows that kids his age may not be like him in a lot of ways. They might physically look like him, they may be in the same grades, but they oftentimes give the kids fine. They prefer the company of either adults or younger kids if they can't find anyone their age who's as smart as they are. The younger kids think it's cool that they know so much. The older kids or adults just kind of accept it after they're kind of shocked. But a lot of times, if there's any social interaction issues, they're raised with kids that are on age one. One of the girls I teach in Conway, again, coming from a typical middle school and then moving into a high school where everyone is used to being the smartest kid, creates some issues. But I also wanted to know if she felt, how she felt and the other classmates. And I, I asked them about three months in last year, so they were even in school a few months. And I said, I want you to reflect back on when you were walking into your middle school as an eighth grader or seventh grader. And now you're walking into this school as a ninth grader. Do you feel the same? Do you remember feeling the same way walking in the morning? Or do you feel different at all? And this girl's expression just 
It's so powerful. She says, when I walk into scholars, I can exhale. And just think of that action. Just do it. I think this is a place for me. I've long believed that what we do with gifted kids academically is good, hopefully, but that we get them together at all with other kids who are as smart or smarter than they are is the greatest gift we can give to them. Because if they finally find somebody their own age who understands their vocabularies and the nuances and their jokes and all of those kind of things, it really is a comfort zone that a lot of them didn't have before. And that to me is one of the greatest gifts, if not the greatest that we have with any G programs that we let me, let me show you some, a few things about parents and, and kids. Give you some examples of putting this gifted piece into perspective. This first came from a mom whose son is in kindergarten. His name is Damien. And this is what he's getting for homework. Now, I don't know why homework is given in kindergarten. That's another issue. But nonetheless, he's supposed to copy his J's one after the other. And he's refusing to do his homework in kindergarten. That's a bad sign. Right? This is what Damien does at home instead of copying his J's. And they are correct. <laughs> so he's adding, multiplying, subtracting in a different number base, and he's getting them right. So I'm like make believe I'm his teacher, and I'm saying, please copy your J's. He's looking at me like, why? <laughs> you know, because there's so much more than J's to the world. He's probably thinking, how many more letters are there in this alphabet? Can't I just copy it four times and move on to room you know, so this is one indicator of a child who intellectually is a little bit different from what you'd expect for a five-year-old. This came from a teacher I know, again, this was in California, and she, every year, gives her students on the first day of school this little piece of paper that I'll show you that's like, what do you do well in school? What would you like to learn how to do better? All right, so this is the first day with Jake. Jake said this is what he does well in school. Everything. What does the teacher say? He says, I know, I know. What's the teacher saying? Stop interrupting. What do you wish you could do better? Nothing. But I don't need help, says Jake. And you need help, says his caring teacher. With umbrellas and rain clouds and lightning all over the place. A psychologist would have a field day with this photo. But look at what he said at the end. He said, I never tried anything I can't do. Well, this teacher knew that something was going to have to be different for Jake because most first graders probably aren't this way, I don't know these things. One thing I want to say too, and I, you know, it was in relation to one, excuse me, one of the comments you made, is a lot of times kids, when they get to be middle school or so age, maybe fifth grade, but usually middle school, if they're gifted kids, they will probably come home at some point and say, I hate that gifted word, I just want to be normal. If they say that, you need to correct them. Because what's the opposite of normal? Abnormal. If they think they're not normal, they think there's something wrong with them when they use that term. What you need to say is, if you could read at three, if you could do the kind of things that you all mentioned at the age they did them, it's normal for them, it's just not typical for kids their age. There's a big difference between normal and typical. All right? The opposite of typical is atypical, which carries no emotional baggage whatsoever. It's just a word. Abnormal carries a lot of emotional baggage. So when your kid comes home and says, I just want to be normal, remind her that she is. But she's learning in atypical ways or at atypical times, okay? That might sound like we're splitting hairs, but that's what these kids do anyway. So might as well take advantage of that. All right, another example from a mom talking about her daughter and son. And this was, the son had not been identified as gifted. He was seven. The girl had been identified as gifted. She was 10. Well, the boy got in trouble one evening because his toys were all over the living room. And he did not put them away. Well, the reason he didn't put them away was he hadn't played with them. His, his sister had. Well, mom said, I don't care. It's your toys you're responsible for. He was not a happy kid. So the next morning at breakfast, he said this to his sister. I know that women live 6.5 years longer than men. But if you don't leave my stuff alone, it won't be you. And you think, think of all, all of the nuances you need to understand to have that make sense in these seven years old. This came from a eighth grade, actually middle school teacher, because I would say that if I had one indicator of giftedness that I couldn't use any numbers or test scores or anything like that, I'd say, tell me your favorite joke. Because oftentimes these kids understand humor at a very sophisticated level, even at a very young age. Well, here's an example, though, from a middle schooler, and I'll read it directly from a 
text that I just finished writing. A middle school English teacher from Texas relates how she was trying to get her students to recall various elements used in writing that made their stories more interesting and varied. One student suggested the use of onomatopoeia, a word the teacher found difficult to spell as she wrote it on the board. Another student suggested the use of irony, and when the teacher asked for someone to define irony, a usually disengaged eighth grader in the back of the room offered this. Irony is an English teacher who doesn't know how to spell onomatopoeia. So, there are times when what you need is just a good set of eyes and ears. Most parents don't have test scores in their back pocket. They have stories. They have anecdotes. They have pieces of gold in terms of information that we need to, as school people, respect. Because you see your kid in relation to all the other neighborhood kids, and they're not better than the other kids. They just are better at things, whether it's thinking or feeling at a deeper level than other kids. I was always surprised when I taught special ed, people would stop me and they go, you know, put their hand on my shoulders, oh, we must have the patience of a saint. I'm so glad we have teachers like you. And then I move into gifted. And it's like, what? Why do these kids need any help? They've got it made as it is. Well, teachers would say, you're taking my best discussant out of class. So I thought I'd have the same reaction, because to me, they're both elements of special ed, just to different ends. And yet, the, both my colleagues' reaction and obviously society's reaction is very different. The federal government spends each year $13 billion on special ed for kids with disabilities. And those are well-deserved dollars. I don't deny any of those. The entire federal budget Thirteen billion for special ed for kids with disabilities. What do you think it is for kids who are gifted? The entire budget. Five million this year. And that's only the first year. The past three years was zero. And now it's five million dollars. It's estimated there are two and a half million gifted kids in America. You divide that by the number of dollars or sorry, and you get about two bucks a kid. You can't buy a happy meal. And yet that's our federal government's generous allowance to give to kids. So there's obviously a bias that we have for kids with disabilities and against kids who are gifted. That I've never quite understood. Because to me, if you're in the top or bottom 3% of anything, you're going to need something different than the same old, same old. It seems to be either, if we, if we recognize it, we certainly don't expect it. Let me share with you one, identif one piece of giftedness that I think is Find, the best definition to find. It's, uh, it's not one that you, any school district will use to identify gifted kids, but at home, this is what you see. I'm just going to stop and let you read now. Oh, I'm sorry, I probably have to do it from being taped. Giftedness is a greater awareness, a greater sensitivity, and a greater ability to understand and transform perceptions into intellectual and emotional experience. The woman who wrote this, Anna Marie Roper, I called her my gifted grandmother. I, I didn't have grandparents growing up, biological grandparents, so I adopted a few along the way, and Anna Marie agreed to be one of them. She died two, about two years ago at the age of 92. Her last book was written when she was 90. She worked with gifted kids for 71 years. Yikes. Yikes. She, was, she escaped Nazi Germany came to this country and started a school in Michigan for gifted kids way back in the 1940s. It started with four children, four preschool children. Aunt Mira was a preschool teacher. And she worked with them, and she saw them become grandparents. Wow. She sees giftedness, and she always did. It's a lifelong experience. You don't age out of giftedness. You don't grow out of giftedness. It stays with you forever. But a lot of kids equate giftedness to school so when they graduate, they figure that giftedness is just not important anymore. It's very important, and it's very there. But I've often had parents who will say to me, you know, my kid was identified as gifted, and they came home and asked mom or dad, were you gifted? They never ask if you are. They only ask if you were. <laughs> because they think, you can't possibly be gifted as my mom or dad, but if you were when you were 12, you're going to be when you're 52. And Anna Marie respected that to such a degree that she came up with this conception, this definition of giftedness that I think is so powerful. And she also talked about, if I can find it here, what she called a quietly gifted kid. 
kids. There are a lot of kids who are superstars in terms of academics. You know, they win the awards academically, and I'm glad they do. But I know a lot of kids who are high achievers and not gifted. All they want to know is, what do I do to get the A? They don't care what makes up that A. If they learn anything new, they're not curious. They're just strong students who are committed to high achievement. I don't think some of those kids are gifted. I also know kids who might be bottoming out in school, but because of their thought processes, because of the way they think, I would consider them gifted people. So giftedness and achievement to me often go together, but they don't have to. They don't have to be eminent to be a gifted individual. Anne Maria Breed, here's what she wrote. The greatest impact is actually made by the vast majority of gifted whose light does not shine on the universe, but instead penetrates our daily lives. These are the gifted teachers, parents, cooks, bus drivers, and letter writers. They are the quietly gifted, the privately gifted. Most often they're not aware of their giftedness, but the same characteristics are found in the privately gifted as in those whose contributions are better known. She had a tremendous respect for all of humanity. Her school was founded, she and her husband founded, on global interdependence. She never wanted to see what the Nazis did happen again. She says, we're de independent, we're dependent on each other. This was 1943, and Anna Marie's words were so powerful then, and they continue to be powerful today. But this view of giftedness to me is just such a strong one that um, I hope you kind of take it and chew on it and think of what it means, because oftentimes parents will see, this sounds like my kid. They seem to be more aware of things around them than others their age. They're very sensitive, and they can put these things together in a package, if you will, that sometimes confuses them, but nonetheless is very sophisticated in terms of what they know. Uh, the next character is, is this. I won't spend much time on this, but the better ad and better than conundrum. It's funny that, again, the gifted provide services for kids with disabilities. We say it's because they, or they need it, because that's, they learn in different ways than kids who are typical six-year-olds or 12-year-olds or whatever, and we respect that. But oftentimes, when you have a program for gifted kids, it's elitist. What do you mean you want to give them, have so much already, so much more? They don't see it as something because a lot of times our culture perceives, we're saying our kids are better than your kids if they're identified as gifted. I've met very few parents and gifted kids who feel that way, but somehow it's, a, it's an attitude that seems to be pervasive. I think part of it might be the word itself, gifted, because when you get a gift, you didn't earn it, did you? It was just given to you, it was handed to you. And so I think people think, well, if you handed this thing, you didn't even deserve it, and you just seem to have it, why should we care about it as much as someone who needs a lot more help and they don't perceive that you do. And that's a sad statement, I think, but it goes along with this quote from a poem from E.G. Cummings, when he wrote, to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest human battle ever and to never stop fighting. A lot of these kids try to reconcile, how can I be smart and popular at the same time? How can I be smart and not look like a show off? Just because I get the best grade doesn't mean you know, that I'm trying to show you up. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on that we need to talk about with our kids, and they need to talk about with each other. And this is, uh, this is one of those pieces that I think we really need to focus on that we haven't too much in working with gifted kids and in living with gifted kids. This one we have focused on a lot. I call it the eight great gripes of gifted kids. And we've used this, we mean my co-author and I in this particular book, for easily 20 years, if not longer, and what happened was we wrote a book for gifted teenagers, and it came out in the 80s. We asked the kids, write us letters, this is before internet, write us letters if you like the book. We had over 2,000 handwritten type letters from kids across the world saying, we like your book, but if you really want to reach us, you have to talk about some stuff we think is important. And these were the things that came up that ranged from you know, what giftedness is, to how do I deal with it in school, to what about friends and friendships and all that stuff. But the one that gets circled most frequently about these eight great crimes, can you guess which one, more than any other, gets circled by the majority of kids? Number two, about school. School being too easy, not relevant, boring, whatever. The one that gets circled second most is number three, about expectations. We've changed it now so it's as parents, teachers, and or kids, because sometimes it's not all three groups. And increasingly, one that's getting circled that never did even 10 years ago is number eight. 
worrying about real problems and feeling that you can't do anything about them. This is the age of instant access to everything. So what happens in our country, the leaders hear about it at the same time the seven-year-old does. There's no division of time. And that's never happened before. And so our kids are hearing things that either scare them or whatever, and they don't know where to put it, and neither do we, because we're hearing about it at the same time. We don't have that lag time that we used to have, so I think that's why number eight is getting circled a whole lot more than it used to before. But let me give you an example of what I've done with students. These are fourth grade examples, where I want the kids to get over the fact about the word gifted. I want them to kind of put it in context. So what I do is I use the word gifted in the middle of a page, and I just ask the kids, tell me what they like about that word, that's the plus signs, and what they don't like about that word, the negative signs. So when I give it to them, the gift that's in the middle, all the other blanks, all the other uh, ovals are blank. So here's Kenny and Tommy, who they say gifted means people think higher of you. That's a good thing. So a good thing about that is when you can help, it makes you feel better. But a bad thing is sometimes they expect too much. Now go to the left. A negative about being gifted is you get more homework. A negative about that, you get less time to play. A positive is you get to, to learn more. All right, so everything has both its ups and its downs. Christina and Molly said, if you're gifted, go up. You can get into better collages. There's not a lot of gifted kids who spell college, right? Okay, so collages. And if they have bad handwriting, I had one kid tell me last week in Colorado he didn't get identified as gifted because his handwriting was bad. I hope that's a lie, but it's him, it's true. But it's be silly. I mean, giftedness and handwriting have nothing in common. In fact, I've seen most young gifted kids have terrible handwriting because they have so many ideas in their head, they're trying to get it down real fast and you can't read anything. And neither can they, but at least the ideas are out of their head. All right, so anyway, handwriting, spelling, no big deal. But if you get out of those collages, you used to get a good job. Let's hope that happens again. But the negative about those collages is they cost a lot of money, so start saving now. All right, if you go over to the left, people think you're perfect, that's a negative. So you get called names when you're not. Like how to get a B in math if you're a gifted kid. But positive thing, people trust you with more things. A lot of parents expect the kids will be more responsible because they're gifted. And sometimes that works. <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't. All right, this one is the last one I'll show. This is from Stephanie. Stephanie was a young fourth grader. She'd skipped second grade. But she, she loved working on her own because she said, I have a fine mind and I like to use it. But here's what she wrote that was so powerful. So it's hard to read at the bottom, but she said, you might not have as good an imagination since you know things are or aren't true than other kids do. A negative is, you might not believe stories that would be fun to believe, but a positive, you can still pretend you believe them and have fun. These kids, like Stephanie, can be socially ambidextrous. They'll use the word Neanderthal, and if the person they're talking to doesn't get it, they'll say, you know, a caveman, knowing it's not the same, but at least you get understood if you bury your vocabulary. Stephanie was expert at doing that graciously, and so she fit in with virtually every kid in school. She didn't say, you're so stupid, you don't know what that word means. No, she did it another way. But she also showed how she could be multiple ages simultaneously. And it's a story not about Stephanie, but about a little five-year-old girl who was getting a, for her sixth birthday, she was getting her first bicycle. And so the parents brought her to the store to buy whatever bike she wanted. And the girl was expected to help the purchase of the bike with some of her birthday money. So they got to the register to pay for the bike, and the girl gave whatever cash she needed to give to the parents. And then the parents pulled out a credit card to pay, to pay for the bike. And the girl is mortified and looks at the parents and says, put away that credit card. Do you know the interest rate they charge on that credit card? And the parents are like, honey, as soon as the bill comes in, we'll pay it. We won't have to pay any interest at all. And then the girl said, well, let's just not buy the bike today. Let's wait until Christmas, and then Santa will bring it, and it won't cost us anything. You know, so you can still believe in Santa, as you should when you're six, but you also know interest rates should be 17%. You know, that's where the kids live in multiple worlds simultaneously, and you know it because you live it every day. The next one I want to show you, I'll skip this one, is called Taking Charge of Your Own Education. And I want your kids to get to the point where they get to be a little older, where they can advocate for themselves. But let me show you what one woman did. It's actually one of my former students and her mom. And this is how the mom tells the story. Katie's third grade teacher finally agreed to let her test out of her weekly spelling words each Monday and let her choose her own spelling words as her enrichment activity. Convinced that a third grader could not actually be spelling these word selections on her own, 
The teacher assumed we must be coaching her over the weekend, and Katie must be coming in with a predetermined list to work with which she had already memorized. You should have seen me laugh one Friday afternoon. The teacher told Katie as we were walking out the door that on Monday she wanted Katie to spell archaeobiology backwards. So work on that over the weekend. Katie took a step back, smiled, and yes, she said Y-G-O-L-O-L-B-O-E-A-H-E-R-A. -E -E that was the day her teacher finally realized she had an exceptional child in her class. That was the day she stopped trying to hold her back. And sometimes you can see it not just with your words, but the underlying beauty of those words. My wife is, is I met her we're both studying in the field of gifted, so that's how we kind of connected initially. And when she was a teacher of gifted kids, she's been everything from a teacher to a principal to a state superintendent, and now she works with the federal government as assistant secretary of education. But she had a fifth grade kid who blew the socks off anyone who met him. His name was Robert, he still is. And uh, the teacher, fifth grade teacher, came in and said that I don't know what to do with this kid. He's blowing the top off all the curriculum I can give him. He took the science book home over the weekend and came back with three pages of corrections. This kid does not need fifth grade curriculum, but I'm not sure what to do. So they called Robert in and they asked him if he had ideas for what he'd like to do. They, he could buy some time and let him pretest out of stuff they thought he'd do. And if he did well, then he'd have all this block of time to do something else. Well, he wanted two things. The first was he wanted to write a paper on the theory of relativity that kids could understand and he titled it Relativity 123. And he has a great quote in the preface that's like, um, I still don't understand the theory of relativity fully, but physicists have an expression, you never understand the new theory, you just get used to it. I hope this helps you get used to relativity. So that was one paper, it took a long time, quite extensive. But the other thing he wanted to do, still in the realm of science, was he wanted to write poetry about different scientific concepts. And so he wrote 20 something poems, all dealing with a different element of science. And to me, this, this actually is my favorite one. Every time a year or so, it's, it's called uh, Fall Leaves. I see a leaf it is yellow with red and orange mixed in. My mind says the yellow is caused by the oxidation of leftover sugars. The red and orange are caused by the emergence of recessive pigments. I see a leaf that is yellow with red and orange mixed in. My heart says the yellow is a bit of leftover sun from summer. Red and orange is the leaf spiraling down the lowest spectrum as it is going to sleep. I see. Not bad for 11. Actually, not bad for 40. <laughs> you had to be 11 when he wrote it. And this happened because of school, not in spite of it. If he had done this on his own, it would have been great, but we couldn't, as educators, take a little bit of credit. This time we could because we made it happen with Robert's. <coughs> and that's what I advocate you look at as a parent. This is a from this website, and that's, I don't give a lot of websites out, but this is the best one in the whole field of gifted education from the Davidson Institute. Uh, I won't get into all of the tales of these two incredibly generous people, so mom and dad with identified gifted kids who have given hundreds of millions of dollars towards making life better for gifted kids across America. And they came out with, if you go on and find this chart, it'll, it'll keep you busy for two weeks when you go on their website with the different sources that they have. The good thing is they charge nothing for any service they provide. Absolutely free for everything. Uh, my only regret being here this week is I'm missing a reception. They're having an award ceremony in Washington, D.C. at the American Indian Museum where they're giving kids between the ages of 11 and 17 scholarships between 10, 10 25, or $50,000 to use at any place they want to go. If they already have scholarships to college, they can put this aside for graduate school hold the money in an interest bearing account and all that. And these kids are everything from scientists to musicians to writers, it's phenomenal. And that's just one of the many programs they run. But there's a lot of folks who do not believe kids should be accelerated. And that could be great skipping, but it could also be early entrance to kindergarten. It could be like what I'm doing in Conway where the kids are in high school and they're getting high school and college credit simultaneously. It could be having a young kid in first grade for mornings and second grade for afternoons to see what fits best. There's tons of ways to accelerate kids, and there's a lot of prejudices that if you do this so socially and emotionally, the kids will be isolated. 99 times out of 100, that's not true. They actually find more in common with the older kids than less in common because they just get it, the older kids. 
happens. And you get such a myth about the, the negative aspects of acceleration that the Davidsons blow that out of the water. So I recommend, this is something that I found some school administrators just have an adamant policy, we don't do that. I don't know why, because there's no evidence that says we shouldn't. Uh, and also, if you have kids who are, oh, I'm sorry, that quote, I, did, I just love this particular quote from a good colleague of mine, Stephanie Tolan. If you don't have the moral right to have one child back to make another child feel better, such a powerful quote. Because a lot of times I've heard, well, if you put the gift of kids in a heterogeneous class, they'll help the kids who, you know, struggle to learn, or the kids who really struggle to look up to the gift of kids. Uh, very seldom does that happen especially with the lowest achievers and the highest, they don't go into, say, well, I'm going to be like that kid. It doesn't usually happen that way. Uh, and it's used as a reason to deny kids services that they deserve to me as a gifted kid. And I think Stephanie's comment here is so powerful. You do not have that, that moral right, if you will. Uh, a good, another website that I said I don't give many, this is another reason I'm giving this one, because it's really good. And it's basically helping your own kids become their own educational advocates. This would be like fifth grade and above. Or I wouldn't do this with the youngest of children. But that definition of self-advocacy is great. It's just meeting the needs specific to your learning ability without compromising the dignity of yourself or others. A powerful way to say, here's what I need, and here's how it will benefit me if I get it. And that's what Deb Douglas has done with this website that just came out no more than two weeks ago. On there, and saying, go to it because this chart is on there, is a 10-step process to help your kid advocate for his or her own education. It's say you set up a meeting with the teacher in a very respectful way, you ask for something different, and you don't say it's boring, you know, your work is boring, I need to do something else. You basically say, is there another way I can satisfy this requirement, and then you give a suggestion. It's, it's lessons intact that a lot of adults could use, but I want to use it with kids as young as 12, so when they get to high school and they get to college and something doesn't fit, they feel they can go to the teacher or the professor and ask for something different in a respectful, results-oriented way. And that's what this sheet does. So again, if you have kids of that age, I would definitely take a look at this on Ron Deb Douglas's website, the one that I, that I just gave you. Uh, next one, and this is where you're gonna feel guilty, some of you, is on um, appreciating that less than perfection is more than acceptable. And I have a part two, I always have part two. <laughs> We'll make this audience participation. All right, I'll do the first one, you do the second. A D minus, ugh! Oh, uh, ugh, that proves it, ma'am. We all have different thresholds of pain. Each of us has a kid, we know, our own is someone else's, who if they get a B plus, they think they fail. Each of us has a kid, who if they get a D minus, still passing. <laughs> I love this. But who is healthier? B plus who thinks she's a failure? Or the D minus who says, you know, the sun will still rise tomorrow, whatever the grade is I got. We have to try to put this, this expectation perfection thing into perspective because our kids are evaluated so continuously. Nine weeks out of each school year are spent on assessment. I mean, that's just a lot of time where kids are being told you're good enough or you're not in terms of your academic performance. Imagine if we got evaluated as frequently as our kids did. I don't think we'd like that very much. Okay, so here's what I want you to do, is let kids know that people who are really good at what they do don't always get things right. Look at professional athletes. Certainly, they do. <laughs> the recent stuff going on, they don't get things right. But look at even in sports where they're supposed to excel and they get billions of dollars a year, whether it's quarterbacks or Baseball players who get on base a quarter of the time, that's good. If you get on a third of the time, you're an all-star. If you get on 40% of the time, you're Ted Williams. But I don't think a lot of the baseball fans think that Ted Williams is a failure because he didn't always get on base. They looked at the bigger picture, the, the whole career, not just one season, all the positions he played, all those kinds of things. We need to point these things out to our kids. I'm a writer, and Denise mentioned I've written 19 books. I've actually written 22. And 19 have been published, and three have been rejected more than 50 times. One book I have has been rejected 36 times. And when I give writing workshops to my students, they want to know two things. How much money do you make, and do you ever get rejected? So I sold them the royalty checks, and they go, that's all? 
especially with e-readers. Anyway, and then they show them the rejection letters, and they go, Mr. D, listen to what this guy said about your book. He really hated it. And I want them to see that that's part of writing. That's part of anything we do. That sometimes it doesn't work the way we hope. So that doesn't mean we stop doing it, as a lot of our kids often do. But just look at these. You know, J.K. Rowling. 25 rejections for Harry Potter because they said kids, their books are too long and too complex, kids won't read them. Ditto. And chicken soup was sold. I mean, you can buy chicken soup via Chia Pet now. But this, you know, kids one iteration after another, and yet people said at one point, it's just not good enough. All right? Point out these things in your own life as well as in the lives of people you know who do things well, and they'd like to do them, but it doesn't always work out the way you hoped. And these are four things you can't anymore say to your kids. I know you're going to feel a little guilty, but I'm just going to say get over it. Okay, go back and just say, all right, never again. When we say to our kids, your report card is good, but I call that a kick in the butt with one T because you remember nothing that comes after the word but. You remember nothing that's before the word but. If you have to say a compliment and you also want to give your kid the urge to improve, fine, just say them at different times. So what you say is, your report card is good, if you need to talk about the other stuff, do it later. Or even better, say, what do you like on your report card and what, do you, what, can, what are you most proud of? But something like that. But don't try to tie in a compliment with an urge to do better. If you work and you get an evaluation, you know the things you remember the most are the things they told you you have to do better, right? So you, all those other things, it could be 20 items and only two of them say improvement needed. That's what you focus on, it's human nature. Let's try to separate those two when the kids are younger. This, other, this will be easy for a smart kid like you. So imagine the, uh, the kids I teach now at, at Scholars Academy. And I'm not sure any parents said this, but the kids are real anxious. What if I'm not smart enough? What if I get there and all the other kids know more than I do? You're a smart kid, you'll do fine. And what if I don't? X. I'm disappointing like the whole world. Much better to say something like, this is probably going to be a challenge, but I've got your back. We'll do this together. You give them that kind of reaction rather than because they're so smart, they'll do fine. They may, but if they don't, that's another story. And this one, I don't care about your grade, I just want you to try your best. That's a crock. What you need to say is this. I don't care about your grade, I just want you to try. Leave it there. Because when you say best to give to kids, many of them think 100, nothing less. I had a girl crying last year because she got a 98, the lowest grade she ever got. That's, I'm glad she got it now, I wish she got it earlier. If you say your best, your kids, if they're perfectionistic at all, will think that means the epitome, nothing below perfection. But if you say, I just want you to try, that gives them the wiggle room to do well, but even though it may not be perfect. That's where to go with that. And the last one, you're not working up to your potential. That's a stab me in the heart thing. Does anyone want to stand up tonight and say, I have an announcement to make? I have reached my potential. Time to die. You know, it's, <laughs> that's a silly statement because it assumes potential is an end point. Right? And it's not. It's, it's like taking a hike up a mountain. You know, you always say, oh, right, get to a point at some point, but you take a rest along the way. Potential is such a loaded word. So if a teacher says, she's bright, but she's not working up to potential, what does a 12 year old do with that? Nothing that I know is constructive. You need to be much more specific and say, let's take a look at how you did these first nine weeks. Where would you like to concentrate on for the next nine weeks? Make it something specific. Or if a teacher says to you, your child's not working up to potential, don't even accept it. Say, I need more specific by what you mean by that, that I can take it back to my kid and say, here's what we need to work on. That word potential is loaded with stuff that you don't need to have your kid in the okay. <clears throat> Anyone feel guilty? Because I've said these things. <laughs> I know I have. But you get over it, you move on. And this one's funny from a kid named Eric. He gave me this after I was giving a talk in his class about when you say certain things, this is what he thinks. It's okay, Eric. No, it's not. Good try, Eric. You'll do better next time. Get the football, Eric. I'm trying. You know, so be careful of the words that they don't say back. And just look at their facial expressions, look at their reaction. Uh, and sometimes, try to do things that have absolutely no winners and losers. Now, I am not, a, I'm not afraid of competition at all. It's healthy. But I don't want it to be so pervasive that kids will only do things where they win or lose. And I found this article in a newspaper in Minneapolis 
just about things we can do is, and a lot of times this is great for grandparents or babysitters or something, uh, of things you can do with your kids where it's just the experience itself that's enjoyable. Number seven, tell them stories in which they are the heroes. Even if you have to stretch them a little bit. I don't care if they're 10 or 40, they will listen to this. My experience with this with our son was he was a freshman in college. It was the lousiest year of our lives. It was the hardest year of our lives because the place he thought he would love, from the time he was 12, he wanted to go to this place, the University of Colorado. Got accepted, went there, and within two months realized this is not for me. And the pain he went through, the psychic pain, if you will, we're 1,200 miles away, it was the most difficult year for us as parents. We wrote a lot of letters back and forth, talked a lot on the phone, all those things. Uh, but it's still not the same as being here one on one. Well, I wrote him a letter about, you know, I basically said, write your dreams in pencil. Uh, because when you erase them and replace them with another set of dreams, Sometimes people forget about what the ones were underneath, but when you write your dreams in indelible ink, you know how hard to try to get rid of them, you kind of see remnants of it. Anyway, so I wrote that letter to him, and he wrote a letter back to me about the relationship that we had and the honesty and all this kind of stuff. It's a powerful letter. It's in my briefcase right now. I've been carrying it since he was 18. He just turned 37. When he got married four years ago, for his toast, I pulled out the letter, and he didn't know I was excerpting his letter. All he knew was I was reading something. Well, it turned out to be his letter that he wrote on Winnie the Pooh stationery. Totally embarrassed him and his, him and it was out there. But I was basically like, this is my hero. This is the kid who made it through a very tough time. And so make them the hero in the stories. And a lot of times there's a ton of truth behind them. And the other one I'll share is uh, Be Silly Together, number 10. The example I have is a dad who was, his daughter was on a middle school soccer team in Ohio. And she, the team was great. They were winning every team they beat. But there was one team just to the north, Seoul and Ohio. And if we beat them, we were going on to the regional finals. And we did win. The girls lost one to nothing in the very last minute. And it was a rainy day, almost like today. It was really grungy and yucky and stuff like that. The field was a mess. And at the end, all the girls get together in this big huddle. And they're consoling each other. And parents keep going over one by one and trying to say, oh, it was a great season, I know you tried real hard, and the parents are getting pushed away one after the other. And then this one dad did something that was so cool. He didn't go over to his daughter. He went to this mud puddle, and he started jumping in. And finally, one of the girls in the huddle saw what was going on and said, I think your dad's whacked over there, what's going on? And the dad did this. And one by one, the girls started coming over, jumping in the mud puddle, they were filthy, and so was he, and guess what? They were all laughing with him, and he didn't have to say a thing. No words were needed. They knew they had a great season. They were disappointed. Let's just wallow in the mud and be silly together. Sometimes, I don't care how bright they are, that's a really cool thing. All right, last big topic of the night is going to be, after this, I forgot I had this up here, Honor Marie Roper again about expectations. Someone asked her way back in the 80s, what's the greatest gift we can give our gifted kids? And she says, not a, not a thing, but a belief that the gifted child is average with gifts and not superior with faults. That means you beat the brightest kid in fourth grade, but if nobody wants to sit lunch and have lunch with you, you're still lonely. Or you get picked last for the you know, kickball team and everyone goes, oh, that still hurts. I don't care what your IQ is. Uh, and then period with faults is the kid who comes home with a report card of five A's and two B's. And somebody says, B's? Not in this family. Not in gifted. Uh-uh. Not going to get you into the right college. All of those things. Bonham Marie, after how many years of working with gifted people, said, that's the greatest gift we can give. I'm going to believe it. Next is to stop paying interest on a billion euro owed. This is getting into the intensity piece. So I'm going to show you a cartoon. It's principal talking with mom and dad about their kid. The good news is your son is advanced. The bad news is we think he's going through a midlife crisis. Everything matters, and it matters that it matters. Uh, I asked you, I think I mentioned earlier, really, that if I had one word to describe gifted kids and people, I would use intense. But take a look at some other words that were given to me by a group of parents who had kids ages four through ten years old who were highly gifted kids. Sensitive, sparkling. 
cranky, was just a four-year-old having a bad day, I think. Uh, but transcendent, transcendent, how powerful a word is that to describe your child? Tender-hearted, fearless, but intense is up there as well. And that's the one I'd like to focus on for just a little bit. Sometimes that intensity comes out when the kids are really young, like this. How do I block my parents on Facebook? Uh, so, <laughs> you know, but the word is this, I'll be going over this with my ninth graders next, uh, next month, actually. But this comes from a ton of psychological research on the psychological aspects of growing up gifted. But I wanted to take that heavy research and make it digestible to eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and high school kids. And that's what this is all about. This does not necessarily describe each of your kids, but let's see if it sounds familiar. Okay, that first one is intensity of thought. <clears throat> These are kids who, when you're young, you think you're teacher, you think they're injured because they're trying to answer a question and like, ooh, 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 because they're so excited. Or at home, you say, honey, you have to slow down. You're talking too fast. I can't hear and understand what you're saying. But they're just so excited. They sometimes literally shake. They go to bed at night, but they don't go to sleep because their thoughts just keep rambling and rambling and on. And if you have one who's quiet in one place and noisy in another, maybe because of this. I find a lot of kids at school tend to be quiet like the thing on the left, what I think, and then they come home. All that stuff that's over there on the left comes over to the right. This could be the reverse as well, but I often see these kids are so intense with the work that they do and the lives that they live. And here's one example of it from an adult who's recalling what it's like to finally have the revelation at the age of seven that no one else had. He said, when I was in second grade, the teacher gave a homework assignment introducing the concept of zero there are several problems in which zero was added to or subtracted from various numbers. Of course, the answer was that the number always remained the same. I sat alone on my room and stared with tears at the seemingly senseless problem. I wondered, how could I add something to a number, and yet the number remained unchanged? Suddenly I understood and had the first mystical experience of my life. The immensity of the concept of nothingness overwhelmed me. I was awed by the realization that mathematicians were brilliant enough capture this immensity in a little symbol. I felt a sense of comfort and light. Most seven-year-olds would look at this homework and say, easy homework tonight. This kid took it to a remarkably different and important place. Uh, that's what the intensity of thought looks like. So I would say to your kids, you know, does this sound like you give your own examples? And do they know any grown-ups who have these kind of ideas? Maybe write their name in, like grandpa does this, my older sister or something. I want them to see that this doesn't make you gifted, but it's also oftentimes part and parcel to being a gifted person. The next is the intensity of purpose. And these are kids who are so committed to getting something done that they want to learn that everything else goes by the wayside. I'll give you just a couple examples. When I taught middle school, I required my eighth graders to do an essay on passion, something they're passionate about that's a part of them and always will be. And this girl, uh, Lindsay, wrote about music and theater and all that stuff. And her back, well, bottom paragraph reads this. I have always used music as a way to express myself. I sing when I'm happy, I sing when I'm lonely. I even hum when things taste good. My parents would tell you that I sing all day long. First lullabies, then children's songs, tapes, classical music, and even country have shaped how I see the world. I think Walt Whitman said something about singing his barbaric yachts from the rooftops of the world. That's what I want to do. Passion for music pushes me to a career in the arts. You can just feel it in here by the, by the comments that she makes. A couple other examples. This one is terrible to read, but the example comes from Family Circle magazine and a website called dogood.com. And it shows kids, especially teenagers, who have done remarkable things because of their sense of purpose. I mean, all of us have purpose. These kids just take it and apply it to something that just goes way over the edge. This kid is a 10th grader from Minnesota, and he found out that his, uh, there was a historic bridge that was going to be torn down because it could no longer be used for traffic, it was unsafe. And so it was the end of the school year, AP tests were all done, and the teacher said, we've got three weeks, what do you want to do? These kids decided to save the bridge, and they had a breakfast thing, they raised money for it, they went to the city council, and lo and behold, Tom Pawlenty, or Tim Pawlenty, who then was governor of Minnesota, signed a decree to make this bridge a national or a historic landmark, and now it's basically a hiking trail and things you can do around there. And when Tom was asked, 
what about this project that you like? He said, it's the best thing we did throughout all of high school. Because it had relevance, it had meaning, it had an end point. And another one is Mimi. And I'll just point over to this area. She played freerice.com. If you kids don't know that website, go on it. Trust me, you'll love me. Thank me in the morning. Which sends rice to developing nations for each answer. It says correct, it's either just actually any answer. To a math and vocabulary question. Mimi decided to design a website called freekibble.com, which gives 10 pieces of dog food to the Humane Society for distribution to animal shelters. Ellen DeGeneres highlighted Mimi and is now the sole sponsor of Mimi's work through her pet food company, Halo. And this is a girl who has donated, because of her work, millions and millions of pounds of dog food to shelters around the nation. She now has one for cats, because somebody said you're prejudiced against cats, and she also has one for kitties now. Has a different website address. But these are kids, again, they're so committed to what they do, and sometimes it's at the cost of things that you want them to do. I always say you're right about it. The next is the intensity of emotion. If any of you have kids who, everyone has emotions, obviously, but these kids don't seem to have any middle ground. It's either here or there, up or down. Everything is extreme. You just want to say, chill out, don't take things so seriously, but that's just who these kids are. Sometimes you see it in just the little things they say, like this. Whenever you scold me, I get a headache in my heart. And there was sometimes you get it just by listening to the listening to their words. I don't have a daughter, but I feel like I do. With this example from a girl I taught in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, and now um, I've continued to stay in touch with her, even though she's a young adult. But here's what she wrote about her first boyfriend. When they were in high school, he was 16 and she was 15. And Sarah wrote this about their time together at Christmas. On Christmas Eve, Adam gave me a most wonderful surprise, one that no one I have told had ever seen performed by someone in our age group. He had planned it for weeks, and I later found out my whole family was involved. While I was at the Christmas Eve vigil, he came over and cooked dinner, set up a candlelit table for two in my basement, and dressed in tops. When I came home, my sister led me to her room, I was instructed to put on the dress that I had worn the previous year to a formal dance. At that particular dance, I had worn the dress but came home in tears, but no one had asked me to dance. When I emerged from my sister's room, Adam was standing in the hallway in his tux. He informed me that dinner was waiting. I was literally shaking with delight and unquenchable joy. As tears filled my eyes, he led me downstairs to where the candle at dinner was set up. After dinner, he played, it must have been the mistletoe. To make up for the last time I had worn that dress, Adam asked me to dance, which was truly the best Christmas ever. This 16-year-old's going to go far if he had this attitude throughout his dating life. But when she says about three quarters of the way through, I was literally shaking with delight and unquenchable joy. That's extreme. It's not just awesome. She took it to a different place, and she did this with everything in which she was involved. She was in show choir and was the queen of show choir when she ended up going to the Holocaust Museum in Washington with us on a class trip. She was devastated by what she saw there, but she made it work on our behalf when our funding was going to get cut by the group that sponsored us. And Sarah went in and told one story that is a little long story, I won't tell it tonight, about the experience she had with the Holocaust survivor there. And by the end of that five minute speech that Sarah gave to this group of 300, we had enough of our high school and two others to go back because of the way that Sarah just could show that emotion in such an amazingly powerful way. She, her family always vacations in the North Carolina here in Brunswick County, Sunset Beach. And we live in Cherry Grove, just across the border. So every summer, if I'm here and she's here, we get together just to have a reminiscence about what life was like in middle school and high school. Well, last year, she brought the champagne. She's now 23, 24 years old, and she is now just received her PhD in pharmaceutical oncology and is a one of the head honchos at the Ohio State University Hospital in that area. I can't imagine, I can't imagine actually, someone with her incredible gift of empathy in a field such as pharmaceutical oncology. She is just a wonder, and so are the people that she's treating. She, they must be very blessed to have someone like her there. And then there's this. This is kind of hard to read literally because of the handwriting. Um, and also because of the message that's within it. Let me just share it with you and see what you think about this intensity of emotion. This was a high school student who is the son of one of my colleagues in Colorado. And he was in a senior thesis class in the senior year that 
sounded outstanding in terms of the assignment. The teacher wrote this, as a means of introducing yourself, write me a letter. The letter needs to focus on your experience as a writer as well as your goals, both personal and academic, for the senior year. It's a powerful, wonderful, open-ended assignment. Here's what Greg wrote. Let's get one thing out of the way. I'm lazy. Now, I don't see this as an insult like some people would. I just lack the motivation to reach the high as I could. I've never been the overachiever or the A student. I've never been the sports star or the future president. I honestly could care less about some letter on a paper judging work that I didn't care about in the first place. I could sit here and write to you some BS, but he spells it out, about drive and passion, but then you'd expect it of me and only disappoint yourself. I used to have a passion and fire for the written word. I wrote poems, songs, and stories almost every day. I wasn't complete without a pen in my hand. Then the public education system killed my passion in cold blood. Prompts, essays, written responses with the beasts that killed my love of the art, broken down into nothing more than mediocre paragraphs and lackluster essays. The pen that was once inseparable from my hand was now the shackle of my oppression. He goes on. My goals have changed and now focus on my art, for the pencil, which once crafted adventures and tales of hope, now draws pictures dedicated to cynicism and spite. You'll see me in the back of the room almost all of the time, drawing, and try as you might to stop it. It is the only thing that I seem to care about anymore. But the assassins that once stole my passion for writing will not do the same for my art. So there it is, a glimpse into my writing style and mind. I have no more passion. I have no more motivation. I no longer, school is no longer the place of learning that it once was for me. It is now only a twisted prison filled with others like me whose dreams were pounded out of them by the harsh mallet of conformity. This is the teacher's comment. Brad, I love that your voice came through on this, but try to avoid swearing. Also, you need a greeting and salutation. I actually cried. This kid says, I have no passion, I have no emotion. Hello, <laughs> this exudes both. Mom showed me this before showing me the teacher's comment, and she says, what's your comment? I said, can I meet Brett? I said, he sounds fascinating. And then she showed me what the teacher wrote. I was, as an educator, absolutely flabbergasted that this was, she gave him, a, he gave her a test. She failed. And I asked what happened, and Brett ended up dropping out of high school and getting his GED. And I met him just about a year ago, just about a year ago today. And he's now doing fine. He went to college for a little bit, and now he has his own internet-based company that he's trying to get off the ground, still living in his parents' house. But nonetheless, he was like, yeah, I remember that teacher. She left teaching, I guess. But uh, you know, when you have this much passion and energy, and it just is directed in a way that might make people angry, mm -hmm. because he's really, he's filled with the stuff, with this intensity that oftentimes might not look pretty, but it's very, very powerful. I love this, too, this quote from Anne Lamont from Stitches. It says, as far as I can recall, none of the adults in my life ever once remembered to say, some people have a thick skin and you don't. Your heart is really open, and that is going to cause pain, but that is an appropriate response to this world. It cost us high, but the blessing of being compassionate is beyond your wildest dreams. However, you're not going to feel that a lot in seventh grade. Just hang on. We oftentimes tell our kids, chill out, don't take it so seriously. Those are such disrespectful things. What we need to do is give them a hug and say, sometimes it hurts to be so, so emotional. Sometimes it hurts to be so feeling or something like this. It's, it's such an easy thing to do, but so hard to remember in the heat of the moment. And the last two, and I'm going to stop talking, are the intensity of spirit and the intensity of soul. The intensity of spirit is the example you gave about the, your son who looked at the poster of the lost child and was just like knowing this was wrong, knowing this was sad. And they're the ones who I say bring home all the strings. You know, they, they want to help everyone they can. They have this, this internal drive to just make people feel they're okay no matter what circumstances they're in. You hate if these kids walk by television when the news is on. With all the stuff going on right now in the world, if they're not terrified, they're just anxious. It's just like, why is this happening? Why do people do this to other people? And they might be seven years old. 
and the thinkingness. Uh, that's the intensity of spirit. This is one from a long time ago. It's a uh, right after 9-11, actually. And this was a photograph in the local Cleveland newspaper. It was a rescue worker at the World Trade Center site, just resting for a minute. And I was teaching sixth grade at that time, and we didn't know really what to do with this terrible thing that had happened. Did we talk about it, do we not talk about it? So I use photographs a lot to get kids' feelings and thoughts out. This was one. So my prompt was very generic. It was New York City, a rescue worker, and Alec is 11, and here's what he wrote. He's praying to God. He's not sure there is a God anymore, but faith won't stop working its miracle on him. He is a hero. He isn't hungry for glory, fame, or money. He wants his life back. In New York City, a rescue worker is tired. He gets his energy by the heroes around him, and they get their energy from him. In New York City, a hero is crying. Heroes do cry. Most 11-year-olds wrote, very basic, you know, the man is sad. You know, he feels bad for everyone who died. All those things which are very perfectly fine but they're very literal. These are kids who don't know what literal means because everything is nuanced. Everything has texture. And they are sometimes quite sure what to do with that. Finding ways for them to help other people, other kids, just do whether it's, it's you know, they're, whatever the, the cause is, there are ways to help. Um, to let them do in a little way something that can make a big difference. The last is the intensity of soul. I don't have any visuals for this, except in your mind. Just give you two examples. This is the kid again, the old soul and the young body. They're always thinking of things that other kids their age never think of. And this is from Michaela. She was five at the time this story was being told. And here's what happened. It was her first uh, experience with soccer. And mom says, I noticed that whenever she had practice, she did not pay attention to the ball at all. She was just busy looking into the sky like a dreamer in a far off land. One day on the way home, I said, Michaela, you don't seem to like soccer. It's okay if you don't want to play. I don't want to make you do something you don't enjoy. But what exactly are you looking at in the sky when you're supposed to be paying attention to the drill and instead getting hit by the ball? She replied, oh, I've been studying the geese formations. They seem to be in the wrong formations lately. And I was wondering if it was some sort of danger signal and why they're doing this. I don't want them to go the wrong way for the winter. I'm worried about them. I knew that she was certainly not cut out for soccer that season. Again, she's five years old and she's worrying about the geese formations. And the last example comes from an eight-year-old who uh, was in the Cub Scouts. And what do you call it? Is it troops, dens? I forget, it's been too long. The little local. What are, what are they called? Dens. Dens, okay. So this kid was in a den, he's eight. And the name of the den was the Tiger Cubs. And he, each kid had to come up and say, T is for a team. I is for integrity or something. And this kid was really upset. And here's what he said. Dad, we should have had a space because tiger cubs is two words. Well, you're right, Eric, but who would want to be a space? Five minutes later, he came back and said, Dad, they could say, I am a space. I separate death and life, joy and sadness, good and bad, warmth and coldness. He did this within one week of his eighth birthday. So think of the, the type of T is for teamwork. Oh, I am space. <laughs> this is probably not going to go over the way little eight-year-old Eric thinks it would. All right, I'm ending here, I promise, with this piece. And just to tease you and have you go on that Davidson website, when gifted kids grow up, guess what they become? Gifted adults. And Anna Marie Roper, that wonderful woman I talked about so much tonight, did a piece on gifted adults that is stunning. And she'd seen them become grandparents when she taught them as, as, as nursery school kids. And there are just eight of about 25 different characteristics of gifted adults. So if you live with one, if you use one, and you want to know more about what are these qualities and characteristics, I lead you on to Anna Marie. Uh, she may be gone, but her words last forever. And her, her genius lasts with them. Anyway, it's a few minutes before eight. Does anyone have comments, questions, singing, dancing, anything? Resources I should have given that I didn't? I'm yours. Okay, oh yeah, we won't, if you're going to dance, we won't take it. <laughs> what haven't I said that you needed to know? Thank you.
Yes. I'm going to repeat the question. Sorry. What do you do with young children? So I have an eight-year-old, five-year-old who just started kindergarten. And I have three kids who are in child who's bored at school because he knows the work that's being put in front of them and the teacher says well everyone has to do this work um, one thing you need to do is first of all be as specific you need to be his advocate he can't he's too young to do it on his own right now but you need to be as specific as possible with examples of stuff that he's done at home that he does independently whether it's i don't know if he does any writing at all or anything that shows the complexity of his thinking could even be drawings and if you bring in work that he did at school, that he obviously got correct, the kids don't mind doing that, but if they have to keep doing that time and time again, day after day, then of course they're going to be bored. I wouldn't use the word bored with the teacher because that is sends up chills. And every teacher's, no, no teacher wants to bore their kids, trust me. But also they're not sure sometimes what to do with them. So I would bring in things from home that he likes to do there that he can do after he's done with the work that he has to do. But I would also ask, it's some of the work that he has to do, if he can prove that he knows it, like that first example I showed of copying the J's, does he really have to copy 50 J's? You know, can he show that he knows that in like five examples and then move on to something else? But it may be the teacher's not quite sure what to do, and with all the other kids in the room, she doesn't have the time to find it anyway, but I would see if I could find some materials to bring in that he already uses at home, that he could use later. If there's a GT, consultant or teacher in the building, I would also try to use them as, as a go-between. Uh, first start with the teacher, and then, but be as specific as you can you know, with what, what the difference will make for your child. And you can basically say, you know, if it doesn't work out, you know, it will change, but let's, can we give this a try? So we can trial period, and I can almost guarantee it will work out. Because if he's bored now, he's going to be bored third grade, fourth, you just don't want to go down that path. Seven questions. Just one, just one. <laughs> You have a daughter who's interested in a lot of things, and she seems to explore one after the other after the other rather than focusing on one. I would let her go, personally, because she's in what I would call the golden age of the intellect, when everything is interesting, everything is new, and now she has more skills, whether it's with reading or more, even if it's with dance and stuff, she has more control of her body than she does as a five-year-old. She's exploring all of the stuff that's out there, and eventually she'll focus on something. But I think at nine, I would just let them go. The thing is, it's going to drive you nuts because you're going to get all these resources and books and stuff for her topic, and then she's going to switch over. Um, yeah, just just don't buy, just rent, just go to the library. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I would just say let her go because she's she's exploring right now, and I'm, it's fabulous that she's exploring so many different directions and dimensions. Don't let her pigeonhole. And I find this also as she gets older, and those of you who have older kids. When it comes to choosing both a college and a career, a college major and a career, it's oftentimes very difficult. Now, some kids know from the day they're born what they want to be and all, but most kids, if they're gifted kids, love so many different things. It's like, what do I pick? Because whatever I pick, I can't do all the other things. It's like, I, I'll use the analogy, it's like going to like the best smorgasbord in Las Vegas, 
And when you get in there, they say you can have as much food as you want of any one item. And you go, wait, it's a smorgasbord. Okay, the rule is one item. Well, if you have a kid in high school who is very active in a lot of areas, and I'm a school counselor, so you have to pick a major, it's like going to the Lazio smorgasbord and having one item. You know, it doesn't sometimes fit. If your kid at 17 says, I don't know what I want to be, I don't know what my college major is, shake their hand, say good for you. If they know what they want to be, do the same thing. But I don't want to force kids into something for the sake of saying something. And then they get to college and they realize there's so much here than they ever realized there was. The university I worked at in Ohio, Kent State, had 545 academic majors. You come from any size high school and you say, I want to major in science, even biology, they're going to ask you what kind. And you might even know there are all these kinds out there. So if they're not sure what they want to be, don't make them feel like they have to choose because that's what most people do. Most people may not have all of the potentials and talents. It's called multi-potential. The ability to be so many things and the difficulty in choosing one. So it's kind of what she's going through now except with interests rather than careers. My son had five majors as a freshman. He started in creative writing and then took a class in philosophy and said, oh, that's the best. And then psychology and then something in medicine or science. And so he went through, in one year, five majors. That's fine. And he ended up going back to, after he dropped out of this one school, went to another. He went back to the same major he had at first, which was creative writing. Um, if the kid's not sure what they want to be when they're 30, ask them what they wanted to be when they were 12. Because when you're 12, all you care about is it fun, is it interesting, will I like it? You don't care about the money or the hard work it takes to get to where you are. If they don't know what they want to be, whatever they want to be at 12, it's probably you. Also, don't do what my aunt Peggy did to me when I said I wanted to be a teacher. She says, teachers aren't, well, you don't make any money at it. You're too smart to be a teacher, and boys aren't teachers. I can't tell you how many people said to our son, creative writing, how are you ever going to make money in that? Other than his mom, his, my wife, and myself, I don't think anyone asked him, what is it about creative attract, writing that attracts you? That's the question to ask, not the one about how much they're going to make money in doing that. That's not where they are right now. Let them indulge that, that dream that they have. Let me end with a uh, letter from one of my graduate students, actually. I, I have this course that I taught called Social and Emotional Needs of Gifted Kids. And mostly graduate students who were busy teaching and they had families and you know, they came on Tuesday night, but it was, it was still especially in Ohio where half the winter was filled with too much snow. And so I said, well, one week in class, we're not having class. I want you to do something that you don't have the time to do because you're too busy doing other stuff, taking care of other people. But then you need to make it correlate with something we're talking about in this particular course. And I had one young girl, young woman, who ended up um, reconnecting with her mother after a really bitter divorce, and she hadn't seen her in three years, and they ended up cooking an Italian meal together and started doing that every week. And a guy who basically got married because <laughs> she'd been living with this girl for, I don't know, a couple of years. And they decided, okay, now to do it. Two and a half hours would get hitched in that amount of time. So they did that. So they all came back and get people wrote poetry and stuff. And that's what Lauren did. Lauren wrote about herself as a gifted adult as reflected in the eyes of her gifted son. She said this, I have learned I'm not the only one who feels stupid being smart. There may be a reason my boy and I are feeling people. We cry in movies, in museums, upon reaching the ends of books. I have learned I've not always made the best decisions and wish I had more strength sometimes. But I've learned too that my own, and it's okay to use the word, giftedness, has been a gift to him, to my mother, as I navigate with him the pain of being told we're not living up to our potential. Not remembering how we learned to read, or being the only one in ten with a deep passion for all things beautiful. I have learned I've not always been the best teacher, but I have been the best I can. And I've learned now, because my eyes opening for the first time, see who we are, and those that remind me of me or him are the ones that are like us, the gifted to be acknowledged, to be celebrated, to hold up to the light in my heart, examined and cherished. But most importantly, I've learned it's okay to use the word gift. Thank you for coming out tonight. I hope you put some context around this whole gift of thing. Please thank you for inviting me back.
very much appreciated. So just genuine thanks. Appreciate it.